at least for me, one of the key reasons as to why you would want to use Julia as opposed to some other language is that it's got a really, really good GPU ecosystem. It's got really good tooling and stuff like that. But the number one thing that I think it has that other languages are not maybe doing as well um, is GPU computing. Like for example, Rust, a lot of people in my community, they really like Rust, uh, but it doesn't quite hit the same notes. And C and C++, they're great. Again, you have the same tooling, but it's just because you don't have a package manager and all this kind of stuff, it's just really a lot easier to do all the GPU stuff on in Julia as opposed to other languages. Obviously, you know, you guys know there's a whole bunch of other reasons as to why you'd want to use a language. For example, the the auto differentiation tools, or you can still get the performance and and it's relatively usable in terms of languages. I would argue it's much easier to read Julia code than it is Python code, but uh, that's neither here nor there. So anyway, th that's why I made this demo up. It was um, a relatively straightforward example to show people that gives you a relatively simple speed up on the GPU. So in general, um, I was going to do three things. One, I was going to introduce the Julia GPU ecosystem. Two, I was going to introduce what an end body simulation is. And then three, I was going to um, make that end body simulation parallelized and performant using the GPU ecosystem. So at any point, if you guys have questions, just jump in and be like, oh, I don't understand this. And then we will uh, answer those um, or I'll answer that. And then Valentin will correct me when I say something wrong. I'll go ahead and share screen and we can get started. So first I'm just going to CD into like an appropriate directory. So CD projects, uh, CD Sesamix, I guess. And then LS here. Um, I guess I'll just put in temp for now. Cool. So I'm going to open up a file. Rather, I'm just going to open up the Julia shell. OK, we'll start at the start then. So let's just go ahead and, and talk about what a GPU is. When we think about GPUs, we think that they're like these massively parallel devices, right? And so the idea is that you have a whole bunch of threads executing in parallel, a whole bunch of uh, cores executing something at the same time, right? And that's strictly different or quite different than what you're used to for CPU programming, where you have like one big beefy core doing all the computation. I mean, nowadays you usually have like 12 or 20, but it's a different order of magnitude. You have a fewer number of cores that can do more, whereas the GPU has a whole bunch of cores, uh, but they're not quite as powerful, right? There's also some things that you can do on the GPU in terms of rasterization in order to actually use the graphics part of the graphics processing unit. But that type of rasterization, you know, like creating triangles and and somehow pushing that mesh onto your your monitor or something, uh, we don't typically use that side of the pipeline. Um, instead, we use the side of the pipeline that's called uh, that's typically used for like or used to be used for like shaders and stuff like this. So you could imagine we have a triangle, a giant triangle, um, and inside of this triangle we have a bunch of pixels that make up that triangle, and we want to color it in some way, right? So we could say we want it to be red on this side, blue on this side, green on this side, right? And we have some equation that allows us to calculate the inside colors of this triangle, then essentially what we're doing is we're saying, okay, each thread on the GPU, let's figure out where we are in pixel space, and then let's color that pixel of the triangle in that way. It's not a very complicated thing it needs to do. It's just a very simple formula, but you have to do a lot of it at the same time. Uh, and so because of that, we, we try to formulate uh, the questions that we're sending to the GPU in such a way that we don't need to depend on other uh, points in space. So each pixel is independent. You don't really have to care about what the neighbors are doing, right? And this is a core limitation. Well, not really a limitation, but it's it's a performance penalty when you're using the GPU. You really have to rethink how you're writing the code. Um, so it's not dependent on time or it's not dependent on uh, the neighbors or anything like this. You have to think about how you're going to do that parallelism. On the other hand, if you can reformulate your, your system so that it can make use of that parallelism, you get a, a really big performance uh, improvement. Sometimes it's five times, sometimes it's 50 times, or sometimes if you have a really, really crap, crappy algorithm, you're actually faster doing it on the CPU uh, to begin with. And we'll talk about like why that's the case. The truth is when it comes to using the GPU for GPU computing, there aren't... <sighs> okay, it's tricky. So there are a bunch of different GPU vendors. There's NVIDIA who provides you uh, basically CUDA uh, the CUDA toolkit in, in order to write code for their GPUs. You have AMD GPUs, which provide uh, ROCKM, OpenCL, a bunch of different things. Their library is kind of all over the place. Um, you've got Intel, uh, which provides one API. And then you have Mac, which provides Metal. I think everyone here except for Valentin has a Mac. So everything that I'm doing right now, you can actually probably do with a Metal array. The caveat is Float64, and there's some other caveats where like certain algorithms are not um, like yet implemented on Metal backend. But are there other issues more or less that the metal backend is like in its infancy yeah but the fact is that it's there and and in principle and again with the caveats um that it doesn't have float 64 support or anything like that if 
you write the code in the way that I'm proposing you write the code via kernel abstractions, you can probably test it locally, both on your CPU and on, on the GPU before having to connect to a server to get to an NVIDIA card or something like that. Now, the, the problem here is that because there's a whole bunch of different tooling, there's CUDA, there's ROCKM, there's OpenCL, there's Metal, there's One API, there's, there's all these things all over the place. You could technically also use the graphics APIs of Vulkan and OpenGL. It's not very clear how you're actually supposed to approach GPU computing at all, right? Like there's a whole bunch of different ways to do it. So very quickly, I'll talk about like how you want to do this in Julia and why you want to do it that way. So on this system, I have an AMD GPU. So what I'm going to start with is just adding the AMD GPU package. I think it's already added locally, but just in case it's not, uh, I'm going to go ahead and do that. We can tell it was because if I type in SD, it's literally the only package I have installed right now on my machine. That's cool. And to use this package, you do using AMD GPU. And then we, we need to basically send data over to the GPU. So to do this, we create some array. We'll say zeros of 10, 10. And this will be on the CPU. To put it on the GPU, we cast it into a rock array. So a B is going to be equal to rock array of A. It'll take a second, um, but then we have uh, an array on the CPU, an array on the GPU. If you were to do this on a Mac, it would probably look like this, using metal, which I don't have installed. Uh, so it's going to error. Wow. OK, I'm not going to install it. And then you would do uh, MTL array of A. Um, that's a metal array of A. That one might actually fail because uh, you need float32 support. So to do it on Mac, you would probably do A is going to be equal to this, zeros, float32, and 10. And then you can do B is equal to MTL array of A. Um, and that should work. So um, now we have an array on the CPU and array on the GPU. And, and this is something about the Julia API that I, I want to talk about because it's actually kind of important, um, but it's glossed over uh, in Julia. And that we just did something kind of tricky here. We actually allocated data on the GPU and we transfer data from the CPU to the GPU. Um, that transfer of data from the CPU to GPU is generally the slowest part of any computation. Like when you think about it, uh, we're taking a bunch of data, we're, we're passing it from our CPU RAM, uh, mother, the RAM on the motherboard, and we're passing it through the PCIe slot, and then we're putting it onto GPU RAM. And that's just a lot of, of movement of this data. So when we're thinking about GPU computation, we actually want to minimize the amount of data that we're allocating on the GPU. And in, in particular, we want to minimize the amount of data that we're transferring to and from the CPU, uh, to and from the GPU. This it's just because that step is really slow. And this is one of the key differences between GPU computing and CPU computing, where in CPU computing, a lot of times you think of memory management as relatively quick. With GPU computing, and even with parallel computing or distributed computing, when we talk about passing data amongst uh, different computers or against CPU, GPU, um, this is really low, really slow. And it's something you, you really have to think about uh, to minimize the number of times you're doing that. So with that said, we now have A which is going to be our CPU array. We have B, which is going to be our GPU array. Um, and this is where the Julia ecosystem really shines. Basically, we have these arrays, and we can play some tricks, OK, in that anything that we could do via broadcasting on the CPU also works on the GPU. And we'll spin up a custom GPU kernel that will do it as efficiently, uh, well, relatively efficiently. So we can do A is going to be dot equal to 1, and that will set it all equal to 1. And we can do B is dot equal to 1. It takes a second to compile the code on the GPU. Um, <laughs> Give it a second. Um, and then once that's done, it it just works. And that means if you can rephrase your, your um, algorithms, your methods, such that you can use the Julia broadcasting infrastructure, um, you get the performance of the GPU mostly for free. But there's some caveats here, right? In that every time you're using broadcasting, I mean, let's say we do B of uh, this is going to be uh, times equals 2 or something. I don't know. It doesn't matter what you want to do. Oh, dot times equals 2. Um, then um, every time you're using this, it's spinning up its own custom kernel. So every time you're going to be using this broadcasting infrastructure, you have to think about, um, you know, potentially the latency of the kernel launches and stuff like that. Now, the latency, I think, is like in the microseconds range. How, what is the latency usually for a call, uh, Valentin? Microseconds, 500 microseconds is a number I have floating in my head, but... 500 microseconds, though, sounds like... So that'd be 0.5 milliseconds? Oh, well, let's just do an at time. Mm. It's hard to measure that resolution. Yeah. yeah, anyway, point is, in general, like there's been a lot of people who have been talking uh, to me and to other people about like 
uh, basically creating custom kernels that will basically take all the kernels that you're running and like force them into one big kernel. So you, you minimize the number of kernel launches. And in general, okay, in principle, this is theoretically possible to do, but in practice, it's um, going to take a lot of changes to some API. It could be kernel abstractions API. It could be your own API that you're developing. And also it's going to, um, generally, you're probably not, probably the kernel launches is not the like biggest problem you have. Probably you have a whole bunch of other things to optimize first is what I'm trying to say. Um, but anyway, the point is when it comes to Julia, if you want to just use the GPU and you want to use it as quickly as possible, trying to find some way to use a broadcasting infrastructure uh, so that you can just do element wise multiplication, addition, whatever you want to do, it, it will get you pretty far. Um, we had some packages, Ocean Anigans, for example, which is a, an ocean simulation tool that basically was only using broadcasting for a super long time. And it did pretty well. So at some point you need to move into something a little bit more complicated though. And that's what we'll talk about next. Does anybody have questions about like GPUs, stuff like that at this point? Well, well, so I was trying to get it to work the, the metal stuff on my computer and it's, it isn't. So if, for what it's worth, when I when I started the metal.jl, it's only supported on metal three capable devices. I don't oh. know what that means. Do uh, you could, have an M2 or an M1? No, I have an M1. So if that's ah. if that's the limitation, then there we go. It um, might be might be that. Um, yeah, or it okay. might be that you haven't updated your operating system recently. Yeah, I didn't realize there was a restriction with the uh, the M1. I thought just anything that was using Apple Silicon could use metal. I, for, for what it's worth, that was just a warning. And then the actual error when I was trying to assign B was non-Boolean version number used in Boolean context. I don't know. I that sounds like it's a configuration but... issue. Um, first of all, it's good to know. Um, uh, I apparently just lied to you earlier about everything that we could do. You could also do on a Mac. I'm sorry about that. Um, but um, are there are there other questions uh, related to GPUs? If not, I can hop into the um, the end body problem and start coding that up. I'll go ahead and open up a um, Notepad type of thing, and we'll talk about the end body problem. So, what is an end body simulation? Why is everything pink for me right now? Uh, let's do red. Um, so an end body simulation is basically a simulation of n bodies in space. I, I guess technically in time because you're watching them evolve with time, but in general, it's n bodies moving in some way. Now, what is a body? A body can be anything, right? Um, it could be a molecule, it could be a star, it could be basically anything that follows in general Newtonian laws of physics. So for the purposes of this simulation um, and for what we're talking about here, we're actually just going to do a gravity simulation. We could do like Leonard Jones or something like that uh, for molecular simulations. But in my mind, I don't know why, I just feel like I have better intuitive grasp when we're talking about like stars and movement of, of that type of stuff. In general, I'll show you how to change the force law and all that kind of stuff. It, it's, it, it could be a really good exercise for the student of modifying the code that we're writing now and then like using that in whatever you want. But for now, we'll do a gravity simulation. So what does that mean? That means we have a whole bunch of stars in space. So imagine we have like maybe this number of stars, right? Uh, one, two, three, four, four, six, seven stars. What are we doing? Essentially, we have this star here, which I'll color in blue, and it's interacting with all of these stars, green. So to know how this star moves, what we need to do is we need to query. We need to say, okay, how? Um, what are the forces that this star right here feels? Um, and in general, it's going to feel forces from every single star in the simulation, right? So it feels all of these guys, right? And so in order to do this simulation, it's kind of broken into three steps. The first step is going to be initialization. Just putting all the particles where they need to be. Usually this doesn't matter too much for MD simulations, like because you can start with a random distribution or something like that. But if you're doing like a protein model or something like this, it really doesn't matter where those particles start in space because it could take a very long time for them to like naturally find that particular protein structure uh, to begin with. So sometimes initialization is complicated, it's not going to be complicated for this, but it could be. The second step is finding, rather summing, all the forces on each particle. Uh, and then finally, the third step is going to be moving the particles. OK, and that's generally it, right? And when we talk about molecular dynamic simulations, uh, there's a lot of other stuff that you can do with MD, uh, but it's usually boiled down to some sort of end body uh, simulation at the end. And so this is why I decided to choose this one, because it's one, something that I feel it's very intuitive as to what it's doing, uh, two, quite relevant, and three, it's something that you can see a, a relatively good speed up on the GPU with relatively little uh, effort. Now, 
Uh, one thing I kind of hid uh, when I was talking about this just a second ago is that there's uh, a complexity of n squared when we start talking about the simulation. And it should be relatively obvious as to why this is the case. Uh, because to move all of the particles in space, we have to go through each particle, that's n, and then we have to go to each particle and sum up all the forces on each particle. So that means we have to query all the particles once, uh, and then we have to query them again um, on each step in order to figure out what the forces are when you add them all together. Moving the particles is just of order n. The hardest part is going to be summing all the forces on each particle. And so we could, in general, just use the basic broadcasting infrastructure to move the particles because we could use like the kinematic equation or Verlet integration, or we could use something that basically is a very simple equation and just takes all of our particles in some sort of giant array and moves them as uh, some step forward, right? Um, you could imagine doing that. But when we start talking about summing the, uh, the forces on each particle, we kind of want a, a specific function that does what we want it to do. And when we start thinking about this, this is where the idea of kernel programming comes in and where we probably want something more complicated than just broadcasting in order to do what we want to do. Um, so I think now's the time that we actually start coding. So let me open up my giant terminal again um, and let's get started. I'm gonna control D out of here and we'll get started. So we're gonna call it uh, nbody.jl. And there's a bunch of different ways that we could do this, right? So the first thing we have to think about is how we're actually going to hold these particles. What is the data structure that these particles are, are going to sit in? Um, we could just create a giant array, right? It could be three by, let's say, three by n. The uh, We could have like position, velocity, and acceleration um, as like one set of indices. We could have the dimension number, one, two, or 3D um, as the other set of indices. Um, and then we could have the number of particles as the last set of indices. This could work. And in fact, there's a lot of good reason to doing it that way. But I think instead I'm going to create a struct and we're going to pass that struct to the GPU so we can talk a little bit about a uh, Julia's type system and what you have to do to make sure you can write your own custom struct that you can then pass to the GPU. So for this, I'm going to create an abstract. Okay, I'm not. Abstract uh, type. Uh, and we're going to call it abstract particle. Uh, and um, and basically, we're going to create a bunch of different or a couple different particle structs that you can send to the GPU uh, that can dispatch off this abstract particle. So we're going to do struct. And we're just going to say simple particle. And at this point, I'm just going to put it inside of abstract particle. And I'm going to end in here. And let's think about what we actually need here. We definitely need some sort of position, some sort of velocity, and some sort of acceleration. All right, that's cool. But now what are the types of these structs? What do they look like? And, and that's the question, right? In general, it could be 1, 2, or 3D. And you could imagine they're vectors or something like this. But we do know that if the position uh, of a particle is 2D, the velocity should also be 2D, and the acceleration should also be 2D. So whatever type position, velocity, and acceleration are, it should be the same type for all of them. Uh, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to say T. And I'm going to specify that these are all of type T. Um, this has an added advantage, uh, advantage of uh, basically forcing the Julia compiler to statically know what this type is, um, which means that uh, if you want to send this to the GPU, by parameterizing it in this way, you can ensure that the data can be passed over. Uh, and let me just explain what I mean in more detail. So let's run Julia here. Let me do using AMD GPU. And let's create A like we did before. And let's create B as a rock array of A. This works because we're passing just float 32s. Um, now let's create a struct. And we're going to call it struct check. Um, and in here, we're just going to create a single element x. And we're going to end here. Uh, now what I'm going to do is create an array of these guys. So a is going to be equal to check of 1 for i is equal to 1 to 100 or something. OK, there we go. So now we have a struct uh, or our vector of all check 1.0. Um, I cannot pass this to the GPU. And the reason I can't pass this to the GPU is because rock array, ku array, metal array, whatever array you're working, only supports bits types. Uh, this is just one of those restrictions that kind of makes sense when you think about the GPU. Again, we're, we're thinking about how to allocate the appropriate amount of memory to the GPU. And you don't want like a struct that could be a variable size. If the Julia compiler statically knows what the size is, it's, it's easier to pass to uh, the GPU and create the array on the GPU. So let me instead create a new struct, which is going to be called check2. And I'm specifying that this has to be of type float64. I think that works. I think I have to parameterize it up top, but I'm going to try this. This might actually fail. Uh, so let's do check two. 
of 1.0. And let's create A. This one actually might fail, but I think it'll work. Yeah, so that one worked because again, uh, we specified the type here and there's only one type it could be. Uh, if you wanted to create another way or do it the way we just did before, it'd be struct uh, check three of type T and then X uh, is of type T and then you can end that. And this will also work and it could be any type that you want. So that's like the most general way to do it in a sense. Good, so let's go back to the code. Um, and so just to show off the Julia type system a little bit, we could imagine another type of struct, uh, which use like maybe creates uh, a particle with some sort of mass and it would be mass particle. Uh, and then it also takes in some type T and then we take it abstract uh, particle and here takes a position velocity and acceleration. But this time it also has a fourth element, which is a type mass. And we could say that's a type float 64. So in doing it this way, we could basically create some sort of a set of functions that dispatch on abstract particle, or if the particle has a mass, we can uh, dispatch on that as well. Um, so we have this, and let's just go ahead and finish up the uh, initialization step. A bunch of different things that we could do here, uh, but I'm going to try to keep it simple. And essentially what we want is to create a whole bunch of particles that are randomly distributed in space. So we're going to create a function, create uh, random, let's say n random particles. And we're going to read in n, which is going to be the number of particles, and then maybe the dimension number, end here. We're just going to say that for the sake of the argument, we're going to create uh, a bunch of simple particles here uh, because we didn't specify the type. And so we'll just say something like uh, we return back an array of simple particle with uh, some sort of x, y, uh, or rather some sort of position, velocity, and acceleration. So what does what do the position, velocity, and acceleration look like? Well, it's probably like a tuple of two times some sort of random distribution minus, sorry, dot minus one. Um, and then we have to do the same for the position or the velocity and the acceleration. So this, here we go. And then that, I have some typo here. I'll figure that out in a second. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm creating a random distribution from zero to one. I'm multiplying by two. So it goes between uh, zero and two, and then I'm subtracting one. So now all the particles are on average around zero. And I think I want to do this and then say four I is equal to one, two, N. And that should in principle create a distribution of random particles. So let's just go ahead and, and, and plot that. I feel like I did something stupid here. I think your brackets for the tool. Oh. Uh, yes, you're right. Okay, so now let's go ahead and create the random distribution and plot them. So we have one terminal for typing and another one for running. So we're in Julia. Um, that looks pretty. And now we're going to do uh, add plots because I didn't have that before. And now we think about now we have to think about how we're actually going to be using plots in this context because um, we can't easily plot just like this set of tuples in this way. So I'm going to create a new function uh, which is going to be create position array. Um, which is going to take what we have and then, then basically take out the positions so we can plot just a position of each point. Um, and this should read in some set of P, uh, which is going to be um, maybe some vector of some sort of abstract particle type, uh, where a P is going to be within abstract particle and here. And again, the point here is to take our abstract particle and just output the uh, the positions. So we're going to say our dimension number. Uh, so we know if it's one, two, or three dimension is going to be length of p one. It doesn't really matter what dot position. And this will give us whether we're one, two, or three dimensional. And then we're going to say our array that we're going to be outputting at the end is going to be equal to zeros of length of p. Uh, then dimensions. And then we just have to do um, for i is equal to one to length of p. Come on, I can type. And here, and then we just have to basically uh, put the elements into the array. For j is equal to one to dims. It's probably a way to do broadcasting for this, but I don't care. Um, and we're just going to say array of i comma j is going to be equal to um, P of I dot position of J. 
Um, so this will basically turn everything into an array that we can then use to plot with. So let's write this, see if it compiles. We're going to include uh, nbody.jl. And we have create position array. That means everything seems to have run OK. And so we should be able to create n random particles. And we're going to say, let's do 100. And let's do dimensions of 2. Uh, that seemed to work. And now we want to say p is equal to maybe p is equal to that. And then we're going to say um, positions is going to be equal to uh, create position array of p's. OK, there we go. Um, so let's go ahead and plot that now. So we're going to do using plots. It's a little bit annoying, but we can just do plots. Uh, sorry, scatter of um, we want our positions of this um, one. So we're going to grab all the elements and then across the first dimension, then positions of this two, and then positions of, oh, it's just two dimensional. So I think this will work if I just run that. Yeah, so here's all of our all of our particles that we just created. Um, we could also do them in 3D. We'll do a simulation in 3D, but uh, this allows us to generically create um, one, two, or three dimensional uh, one, two, or three dimensional set of of uh, particles to work with. Okay, so now we actually have to start coding the end body part of this. So all of this was initialization, right? Um, all right, so now let's move on to the actual end body part. Um, Okay, I don't know what to call it. Actual and body sim. Um, and like I said before, there's kind of two steps to this process. Um, the first part is going to be uh, some sort of function to find uh, your accelerations. And then I don't know what that's going to look like, but you know we need that. And then another one, we need some sort of function to move the particles. Okay, so let's start thinking about what this actually looks like. Um, we know that the function that we need at the end of the day, because we're doing a gravity sim, we're going to need some sort of gravity function. So let's do function gravity. Um, and this obviously needs some uh, particle. So we're going to say this is going to be simple or maybe abstract particle. And then we need P2, which is going to be of type abstract uh, particle. And then we probably need some sort of like gravitational constant, which I'm just going to do g is equal to 1, because I don't know what the gravitational constant is, and it doesn't matter for these purposes. Um, and then all we're going to have to do is find some way to do basically the force of gravity. The force of gravity is gmm over r squared. Um, I'll just write it out uh, here. So the force that we're looking at here is going to be f of gravity is going to be equal to the gravitational, gravitational constant of m1, m2 over r squared. Because we're using a simple particle or an abstract particle type, um, we just assume there's no mass 1 and no mass 2. And so it's really just g over r squared. So the big thing we need to calculate is r squared. So let's do that. r2 is going to be equal to um, the sum of p2 dot position uh, dot minus p1 dot position. Um, and it should be dot squared, I think. Oh, and then we have this to finish the sum. Wait. I think this is what I'm looking for. Um, and note that I'm using the broadcasting infrastructure here because otherwise I have to like think about what the dimension number is and all that kind of stuff, whereas this kind of just lets me go ahead and do everything uh, without having to um, uh, write an unnecessary for loop. OK, so we have R2 here. Um, and then we need some sort of unit vector, uh, which I didn't mention before. But essentially, that's the, the thing that allows you. To, so GMM over R squared gives you the uh, the amount that you're moving in, but now you have to specify the direction you're moving in, and that's what the unit vector is. So we're going to say this is going to be equal to p2 dot position um, dot minus p1 dot position, uh, and then dot uh, divided by square root of r squared, which gives you the magnitude of r squared. And so now we have this, and we can just do uh, return uh, should be something like g over r squared. Um, dot times unit vector, uh, times unit vector. And I think that's right. Um, but there's something we have to do here as well that I think maybe most people forget, and it's called softening. And I'll explain what that is right now. So let's say we have two particles and they're super far away. Um, the force of gravity being gmm over r squared uh, means that 
they're super far away. They still feel either feel each other's forces, but not very strongly because R is the distance between the particles and they're very far away. But let's say they're super close, like right on top of each other. Then the force of gravity is incredibly strong, right? Um, the problem with this is that that means that the force that this guy feels goes really strongly in this direction. And the force that this guy feels goes really strongly in that direction. Um, so what we have to do is we have to modify the simulation so that this R squared value never gets too high or find some way to do collisions, right? And it's really difficult to do collisions. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to take this GMM over R squared and we're just going to add one to the denominator. So it, basically the denominator never goes uh, below one. Uh, what this means is, okay, yeah, maybe you get slightly unphysical results when you're incredibly close, but it's incredibly unphysical for these objects to like pass through each other and go really fast. So it's it's kind of give and take here. And in general, if we assume that the particles are generally far away, it's not a bad guess. Um, this is what a lot of people do for, for these types of gravity simulations. Um, and so in here, we're going to do R squared. Uh, and then we're just going to add one to that. And that should be our gravity force done. Uh, keep in mind, we could also do this for mass particles. And if we were to do this with mass, mass particles, we'd basically add in a mass uh, one and two here. Um, and then later on, when we're just finding the acceleration, we would subtract out the mass two. So you could just multiply by mass one or something. And if you want, we can do that. But I think for now, it's okay just to keep this uh, massless and, and unitless. Okay, so now we have to think about how we find um, the acceleration between two particles. So we have this gravity thing, right? And we have two particles, which we'll say P1 is going to be a simple particle. And then we have P2, which is also a simple particle. Oh, abstract particle is fine. And then we do P1, abstract, a particle. And because we have a force law and we're going to have to pass it in, we're basically going to put in, um, in the keyword argument here, force law is going to be equal to gravity. This is an easy way that we can change the force law if we want. It, you know, there's some caveats in terms of using this on the GPU, but in general, this will work. And all we have to do is the following. We just do return force law of P1, P2. And I think that should just work as we have it now. So now we can find the acceleration between two particles. So if we have to find the acceleration for all the particles, uh, we just go through each one and we just do find acceleration on each one. So now we have to talk about how we move the particles. Um, I guess we'll just move particle singular here and we take some P1. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to do this, right? There's Verlet integration, there's uh, uh, Eulerian methods, there's Rung Rungakata methods, but I don't really care about any of that. So what I'm going to say is that to move a particle, we just use the kinematic equation. So that's going to be X, uh, the next position, is going to be whatever position you're at, X naught plus V naught T. Uh, usually like some sort of delta t or time step, plus your acceleration times t squared. Now, an important thing to note here is that we have the acceleration, we just calculated it. We have the position, uh, right, which we've talked about before, but the velocity here is actually something that we're also probably going to want to calculate um, when we're talking about moving the particles because it's dependent on your acceleration that we just calculated. So I'm going to kind of throw that all into a single function. And again, you could, if you want to, code this up slightly differently, um, but this is just how I want to do it here. So we move the particle on P1, and we probably also want the acceleration, which we've just calculated. Um, so we're going to have a new velocity, which is going to be equal to whatever the new acceleration is, times dt, which I also need just now realize I have to add in here as well. So we'll P1 dt here, sure. Uh, and then we're going to do, I think it's just dot plus, right? Uh, the old velocity, so p1 dot velocity. Uh, I think you just add it to it, yeah. And then we need a new position, uh, which is going to be, which is just going to be the kinematic equation that we wrote before. Um, I think I, just to make this general, we don't have to do it this way. Uh, I'm going to add in a routine here, and we're going to add that as a separate function. And we're going to say kin kinematic, and then we're going to create the function for kinematic up here. Uh, this takes in P1 and the acceleration. Uh, sorry, position probably is going to take in position, velocity, acceleration, and dt or something like this. Um, and again, this would mean that if we want to change our, our, um, our routine that we're using, we could just change it up. 
So routine, and we're going to say um, whatever the position is, so p1.position, uh, whatever the new velocity is, uh, whatever the acceleration is, and then uh, the dt. And that should give us a new position, and then we just have to create a new particle. Um, so we'll do, again, because we're working on the generic um, abstract particle class, and we just assume that's all going to be using simple particles, we're going to do simple particle of, um, and then we just do the tuple. We cast it onto a tuple of new position. And then we do tuple of new velocity. And then finally, tuple of new position. Uh, new acceleration. And I think that's everything for now. Um, and this will automatically return it, uh, so we don't have to type in return. And then for the kinematic equation, we're just going to say the following. We're going to return position dot plus um, uh, velocity times dt uh, dot plus uh, acceleration um, times uh, dt times dt, dt squared. Um, Oh, but keep in mind, these could be tuples. So this needs to be dot times. And then I think we can keep the dt times dt as it is here. So dot times dt. Um, this, I think, will work just fine. Um, good. OK, so now we can write, finally, the end-body simulation. We have all the steps. We have the ability to find the acceleration. We have the ability to move the particles. So now we just write the end-body code. So function. Uh, end body. Um, we're just going to assume, I think, for the sake of the argument, that we're going to read, we're going to initialize the particles in the end body functions. You could do it outside of it if you want. So we're going to n is the number of particles we want to run with, and then uh, time steps or something is going to be the number of time steps we want to run. Um, what else do we need here? Um, maybe I'll change the name. I think lamps use n steps, right? What does lamps use? N steps. And steps, I think, is what LAMPS uses. And then we specify the other stuff that we need. So we need a DT, which we're going to set to 0 0.01. It doesn't really matter what it is, so I'm just going to set it to something. And then our dimension number, which I'm going to default to 2. And then whatever we want for plotting. So for example, we could do uh, the plot steps. The number of steps you take until you plot is going to be equal to 10. And then we could do um, whether we want to output it as images or not. is equal to, let's do true. And then finally, yeah, I think this is all we need for now. Uh, but later when we start working on the GPU, we might also want an array type. So I'm going to go ahead and add that in now by default. And we'll talk about how to use that in just a second. OK, so in principle, this should be relatively straightforward. We're going to create our particles. Um, and this is just going to be create n random particles. And we're taking n as an argument here. Uh, and we're going to call this, I don't know, uh, particles. Oh, particles equals. What am I doing? There we go. Um, I even mistyped it. So particles equal to that. Um, so we have our particles. And now we're just going to do 4i is equal to 1, 2, n steps. Uh, pretend I can type. Uh, I cannot. Uh, so 1 to n steps. You did 4-1 again. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll fix that. I just noticed that as well. I'm sorry. I was trying not to be super embarrassing here. So for j is equal to 1, 2, n, uh, and then we're going to need a third loop in here for k is equal to 1, 2, n as well. We'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so end here, and then down here, we're going to end here. And then here, I'm putting an i, because apparently I keep, how do I keep typoing that? Like, they're not even close on the keyboard. Um, OK. So essentially, what we have to do is we go through all the steps of the simulation, and then we go through each particle and we query the uh, velocity, uh, or sorry, the acceleration, and then change the position. So what we have to do is we have to say something like uh, new acceleration is going to be equal to find acceleration of uh, particles of i, uh, and then particles of j. And we probably want some sort of caveat in here saying if i is not equal to j. Oh, is j and k equal? If j not equals to uh, k. And one second, uh, we want to do jk here. 
And again, this is a super simple way to do it. If you were doing this for an actual simulation, uh, you would probably want to do uh, what's called a neighbor list, which is basically to say, okay, every particle is not interacting with every other particle. We, we specify which particles you're interacting with. Um, and this could cut down the algorithmic cost. Um, uh, essentially, this means if we go back to our little diagram here, um, it means that this one particle in blue um, only interacts with maybe these group instead of all of them in space. Um, the reason you might want to do that is because, well, you know, the, the force of gravity falls off as one over R squared. So you don't really care about these particles that are super far away. You only care about the ones that are up close. Uh, so you can just say, let's just grab that group of neighbors and work with that. In some cases, this can drastically increase uh, your performance, uh, decrease your runtime, because you've changed it from an N squared operation to an N times the number of, of uh, neighbors. It's still kind of N squared, but, you know, it's... um. Uh, it could be a lot faster if, if you cut down the number of particles you're searching through from like 100 in the simulation down to 10. Um, but again, I didn't want to get too much into that for now. So you have the new acceleration, and we probably want to say the new acceleration is going to be um, plus equals whatever the acceleration was before. And we want to say the acceleration is equal to zero up here. And then we're going to end this if statement in here. Uh, just for formatting's sake, I'm going to move this down to the next line. So after we've done all this, um, we should have our new accelerations found. So that's loop number one. And now we need a second loop in here that's going to say for uh, j is equal to 1 to n. We're going to end that in here. And then we should just be able to do whatever. Move particle of um, p of j. Uh, and then acceleration, new acceleration, and then dt, which we read in from the start. Um, and we're just going to assume we're going to be using the kinematic equation. But again, you could read that in or change it. I think this is what we need to do. I may have missed something. And then finally, I, we have to, oh, go ahead. I think you want to move new acceleration oh. out to the loop under i. Oh, you're right. In the outer. You're right. You're right. Yep, that's correct. Okay, um, so now we just have to do plotting. And so this should be uh, if output image, uh, images, this is a stupid way to do it. I don't know why I did it this way. I, I should not have done it this way, um, but whatever, I'm sticking to it. Uh, so we say, if we're going to output the images, which we set as a, uh, as a Boolean, um, and then if I modulo plot steps, is going to be equal to zero. Uh, then we go in here, we end that. And um, we then create our array, which is going to be our position array. R is going to be equal to create a position array, like we did before, of part, uh, part. I'm having trouble typing, guys. I'm sorry about that. And then we just have to put the plot routine that we did before, which is scatter of positions one's position two. This is where I, I don't really know the best way to do this, but maybe it doesn't matter too much. We're just going to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, maybe you want to put that move particle up into the other, the original 4J loop, because I think you're oh. going to lose that new acceleration every. Actually, time. you're right about that as well. We didn't need the second loop. I could just put it at the end right there. Yeah, that's, that's correct. And for this, we're just going to do, uh, I'm going to create a plot. This is going to be equal to uh, plots.scatter. Um, and then we just do uh, positions of this in here. Uh, but I think we called it array. So I'm going to call it array in here. And just as a little trick, uh, just because um, we want to make sure that the box is still a box, no matter what we do, I'm just going to set the x, limbs, uh, the x, y, and z limits, or in this case, just x and y. So we're going to say x limits. Uh, x limbs are going to be equal to negative uh, 2, 2 which is just about as big as I could imagine they get. And we don't really care about particles that get too high. So y limbs is going to be equal to negative 2, 2. Remember, we're initializing them all between negative 1 and 1. This could allow particles to escape that initial box, but should still be OK, I think. Um, and then I think just for fun, we'll return the particles at the end of this. Yes. And I hope that's everything. If this, if this like works, I'm going to be incredibly surprised okay oh wait a minute wait a minute uh new acceleration is going to be a tuple 
because obviously it's going to be a tuple. Um, how do I do this? Zeros of the no, no, don't do uh, the explicit. Uh, oh, you want n uh, the function n tuple zero. This? No, I'm dumb. One comma too much. There we go. <laughs> Sorry. There we go. Uh, this. Can I ask why do we work in tuples and not vectors? Uh, the reason is because um, at the end of the day, I want to pass this over to a, uh, there's two reasons, actually. That's actually a very good question. So one, I want to pass this over to the GPU. And a tuple is distinct from a vector in that the tuple has, a, you statically know the size of the tuple at, like, from the Julia compiler. So if I created a vector of 0, 0, um, this is a two-element vector. And I can, like, add to that and all that. But if I create a tuple of this, and then I look at the type, uh, type of this guy, you see it, it's tuple of int 64, int 64. And if I were to do 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, it's now of n tuple 8, int 64. So it's known by the type. Valentin might have other things he wants to say about it as well. Um, uh, so it's... so the the big thing is we can't allocate arrays, um, new arrays on the GPU. So we need to work with fixed sized vectors. Mm -hmm. so typically, um, uh, we would say, hey, maybe we need to use um, an S array here. Right. A static array. And right. um, basically, a static array is just a tuple in a trench code. Um, but James, uh, do you know that it's always going to be, uh, uh, acceleration is only going to be two-dimensional? Oh, uh, you're right. It should be dims. Yeah, so that's the reason why why the n tuple function is useful because it allows you to pass in the number of dimensions. So yeah. can you interchange tuples with S arrays? Do they function I, essentially? I think so. okay. um, S arrays are def defined to have a vector space. A tuple doesn't have a vector space associated with it, so you can't do arithmetic on it. Mm -hmm. So okay. this is why like element wise arithmetic is fine, but like right an S array you can just plus minus subtract. One second, I, I was I was debugging while Valentin was talking. That way we could uh, double up on. That's what I get for not thinking and just typing. Okay, so that seemed to run. <laughs> um, let me do a quick ls here. Um, it looks like I don't have any of the output images though. So uh, you're not I mean, pointing it to file. Yeah, I was gonna say there's not. I mean, you're just you're, 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 just you're not plots. saving your plot. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that would do it. So let's create a file name. It's going to be equal to out, um, and then we'll just use lpad of what is it? It's like something like i five uh, zero or something. And then we want to do uh, star dot uh, png. Yeah, that would do it. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that. And then we're going to save that. I think it's save fig. Oh gosh. Uh, I, why are you multiplying lpad? with an argument list. Well, he's concatenating the string, but he's... Yeah. But, no, I, but, it's but Elpa, if, if Elpad Elpa is a function... Yeah, okay. Thank you. I, <laughs> thanks for thanks for explaining this to me. Yeah. Well, this is happening. I do have one really high-level question that maybe is too big, but I, what, what, what is different about a GPU memory architecture that requires everything to be so statically typed and and like everything's got to be a nice fixed size whereas you have much more flexibility on the cpu it's not about the memory architecture necessarily it's more about what what kind of things are really fast and what kind of things are really slow mm. and so on GPUs have become more like CPUs, and CPUs have become more like GPUs, but they're still fundamentally different execution environments. And so um, you can do allocations on a GPU, right? You can allocate something on a GPU, but it becomes really slow. And the latency of doing the allocation becomes then very dominant, and it's like not a thing you want to encourage necessarily. And additionally to that, in order to do allocation in Julia, you need what we so call like you need a runtime, right? We have um, our own memory manager, our gar own garbage collector, stuff like that happening. And so, the question is, how much of that runtime would we need to be able to execute on the GPU? 
Mm. And so um, different hardware accelerators have different um, amount of runtime that they can support, right? Because you don't want to like load a five megabyte, 15 megabyte big shared library onto the GPU just to execute Julia code. And so really what we call um, GPUs, uh, we call them runtime free or minimal runtime systems. And so if I'm trying to do a memory allocation, right, the, um, the is there an easy way to do it? Um, yeah, kind of. But also if you're doing it, your code is going to be really, really slow doing so. Um, and we, we even had a full prototype where we had a um, bump pointer allocator on the GPU with a very minimal garbage collector. And um, it worked. It just making it, making the user's code so much slower was like, well, now it's user more user friendly, but now the user is spending all of their time trying to find out where the performance went. Mm. Okay. Nice. While while we were answering that question, I did get it to work. So now we see all the particles in space and they're all moving together, Ooh. which is what you'd expect for gravity simulation. So the embodied sim works now. And now we can talk, talk about parallelization. Um, essentially, what we've done here is we've created an n-body simulation that works on a single core on your machine, right? And now we have to talk about parallelization. And the reason parallelization is important is simply because um, there is not, I, I don't think anybody on earth right now writes code on a single core. That's not true. There's probably some guy, but most people don't write code on a single core machine. Like almost everybody has at least one, two, three cores available, right? Um, and so the question is, how do we make use of the, that additional additional power you have on your computer, right? And in general, there's two ways to do this. The first way is just to take the serial, serial code that we've written and then to modify it in such a way that it now makes use of the threads that are available. So if I go over here and I write htop, uh, you'll see that I have uh, 16 threads available, zero to 15. Um, and the question is, how do I use those other threads? Uh, the very simple answer is to run Julia uh, dash T12. In this case, I'm running it with 12 threads and do everything that I've done before. And that in principle gives me 12 threads, but I'm not making use of those threads. What I need to do is, is I need to modify this code to make use of that parallelism. And again, the naive approach is just to take a for loop and do threads dot at threads or, or, or to parallelize one of those for loops. But we can't parallelize any for loop. It has to be one that we've specifically chosen for the reasons I mentioned earlier. The loop has to be independent of the other um, locations in memory, right? Uh, like the GPU is really good at modifying one pixel as long as it's independent of the other pixels. Um, we need to consider that as well for basically any type of parallelism. So if if we were going to parallelize this loop and or these three loops that I have uh, written here, and we want to distribute that across all the cores that we have, pop quiz, which of the three for loops do we, do we uh, work with? This one, this one, or this one? Well, ideally we want to parallelize all the three. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about that. Then. <laughs> um, the answer is probably number two, um, this one right here. And, and the reason is the following. Okay. So the first one is paralyzing across time, which doesn't make too much physical sense. There are algorithms known as like, I think they're called parareal algorithms that you allow you to paralyze across time, but it's not common. It's not the, the typical approach. Um, typically you can't do the parallelism, parallelism across time because time step one relies on time step two, which relies on time step three, or rather the other way around. Three relies on one, relies on two, on one. You know what I mean? You need one time step to calculate the next. And you can maybe get away with that by playing some tricks, but it, it's hard to do that. Um, meanwhile, this loop in here looks like it, it could also paralyze just fine. Um, but the problem with this is that we're consistently adding to this one new acceleration value. And because of that, um, you could run into a, a race condition where let's say core one has already created its new acceleration and core two has already created its new acceleration and they both have to write to the same location in memory. Rather than figuring out how to do that, it just ends up being that whichever thread was fastest writes to it first and the slower thread writes to it second. So let's say you have one thread that calculated the new acceleration should be two and the other thread calculated the new acceleration should be two. Well, these should be somehow added together to four but that's not going to happen um, unless you play a trick, uh, which I'll talk about in just a second. What's going to happen is you're going to get 
that new acceleration being overwritten in that location. Um, the trick is to use something called an atomic operation, um, which is generally just like an at atomic or something like that macro. But the reason you don't really want to do that is because what you're doing when you do that is you're taking what is inherently a parallel system and you're forcing it kind of serial for that one step. So you're slowing that operation down just a little bit um, so that you can add or do something like that. In general, if you have to do a sum like this, um, you, you want to use an atomic operation. And there's some cases where this makes a lot of sense. For example, in histograms, um, where you have like a single data point and it's probably not, but might interact with all the other data point. Like you have like a large 2D array and you're trying to figure out where this point is or where like a hundred points are on the space. Probably those two points are not going to interact with each other. So it's totally fine to use atomic operations. But in general, the easiest thing to do would be to go in here and run threads dot at threads here um, just for this outer J loop. And I think at threads with an S, I think they'll just run unless I'm stupid. Um, so let's run Julia T12. And now we're going to do um, include the file. And then we're just going to run it one more time uh, here. And yeah, it just, it just runs. So we, we've done it in parallel. Uh, we're not running quite enough steps here. Uh, but James, isn't there a potential here as well for a race condition? Because the um, each step, right? Oh, you yeah. look at find accelerations is observing particles, doesn't it? Well, because you're, you have the move particle at the end. And then if something is moving, Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. That's yeah. why I had the two separate for loops in the initial code. Yeah, because I wanted that was why. But the problem is, is that when you had the two yeah. separate for loops, you didn't carry over the new acceleration. Right, right. So what I had to do so, is I had to define the acceleration up top and then, okay, well, let's just do it that way. Then you're right. Okay. So some, no, that doesn't work either. Down here is where I want it. And but then, the for loop should go with, I think, after the I loop, right? Like, oh, yes. So you have uh, one J loop, well, you have two J loops. Yeah. Okay. I okay. We'll we'll deal with this in just a second. You're right. There is a race <laughs> condition here. Um, completely right. It is there. Uh, but I'm I'm gonna deal with this in a different way because I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> and you're right. There is a race condition. Everyone acknowledge the race condition, and then we're gonna move on because I don't want to be here for the rest of eternity. And I've forgotten exactly how I dealt with this in the original code. So um. Right. Um, now let's start talking about another way, another approach that we could do here. Um, so this is where kernel programming comes in for Julia. So there's a couple different ways to introduce this. So kernel programming initially is the type of programming that you think of um, when you're writing code for the GPU. Instead of writing a GPU function, you write a GPU kernel. Um, really, it does. They're they're both functions. It doesn't matter too much. You don't have to think about the difference between a kernel and a function. Um, the big difference is that. Um, when you think about kernels as opposed to functions, these are, are thought of as running, uh, each thread spawns them independently, right? And that's the big difference here. So let's just think about what this kernel might look like. Um, so I'm gonna go up here and I'm going to uh, use the kernel abstraction syntax. So I'm gonna go up here to one and I'm gonna do using, using kernel abstractions. Here we go. We're gonna move down here. And I'm just going to go ahead and create some sort of kernel uh, using that syntax. So we're going to do at kernel. And because I'm going to be uh, working on like all of the particles in bulk, let's do the accelerations first. And we're just going to do um, find accelerations. So function find accelerations, plural. And then I'm just going to call it kernel here. Um, OK. So what this is going to take in is it's going to take in what is essentially an empty an empty vector that's going to be accelerations. Um, I'll talk about why I need that in just a second, and then it's going to take in the particles. Oh gosh, I, I'm just typing, I typing everywhere. Um, there we are, and here. Okay, so note I did a couple things here. Um, one is I I modified this function so it works uh, with an exclamation mark. It's purely Julian notation, but what the exclamation mark means is that I'm mutating data. I'm changing data um, in place. Um, when we talk about kernels on the GPU. In general, that's what you want to do. You, in fact, I don't think kernel abstractions, I mean, it certainly doesn't allow you to return back a vector. So you don't create the vector in the function, rather you allocate the array outside and then you modify the function or modify that data um, in, in the function itself. So what does this actually look like? Um, well, essentially we just take, um, um, we take what we had 
before, and we just kind of put that for loop into the kernel. So we're going to do J, which is the index we were using before. And now I'm going to introduce some kernel abstractions notation. I'll talk about what it means in a second. Index, uh, global, linear. And then uh, we're going to do exactly what we did a second ago, which is just this, this guy in here. So I'm just going to grab that, and I'm just going to paste it in here. Um, so this is going to create our new acceleration. Um, but in, in actuality, we can probably just do the following. We can say accelerations um, of j uh, is going to be equal to whatever the accelerations of j was before, uh, dot plus the your find acceleration guy. So it's the same thing we just had. With j and k, I think that'll work just fine. Um, and note that we're we're going to be mutating these accelerations in place. So uh, now the the big thing, because we've taken out the for loop and we've basically taken that j iterable um, and we've put it into uh, the kernel. So now each thread can run this independently because you don't need like some. Uh, did you have some say, Valdi? The the other form where we are doing the accumulation over the loop um, is still more efficient. Uh, which form? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, so where you do the right. uh, new acceleration equals... Um, You're right. Um, and also the question is, is accelerations always zero initialized? Yeah. So, right, so right now we're doing an in-place update, and so new acceleration equals zero of accelerations. Or something like that. Yeah, this would also be fine. One second. And then... Yeah, I'll talk about that. Oh, I just pressed a button, and I don't know what button I pressed. <laughs> All right, there we go. And then at the bottom, we can do accelerations of uh, j is going to be equal to new acceleration. So there's two things to mention here, then. One is how we get j, and two, why this is actually more efficient. And they're both kind of related. Um, so what I said before was when we talk about GPU programming, the number one thing we care about are, are memory accesses, uh, memory transfers. Basically, we care about memory, right? Um, and we're trying to make sure that we minimize the amount of times that we're allocating data um, or, or, or um, writing, uh, but also uh, reading that data. Uh, because on the GPU, I mean, kind of on the CPU as well, but on the GPU, it's it's very relevant. We have different memory banks that each thread has access to. It has uh, a memory bank that's uh, available on each thread. Then it has a global memory bank that's accessible to all threads. Um, and then it's got kind of a more or less local memory bank um, that is um, accessible accessible only to a certain block of threads that are executing in parallel, right? Um, that uh, that block of threads in NVIDIA speak is called the shared um, a shared memory tile or something like this, which is kind of confusing because now when people talk about shared memory, they're oftentimes also talking about unified memory. Um, and so just, it, it depends on who you're talking to. But um, yeah, just shared memory is in general, when I say shared memory, I'm talking about specifically a, um, a region in GPU memory that allows threads to quickly access um, data um, that's not at the thread level. Um, so when we did this at index, we're indexing over the global memory, right? Uh, over some sort of global iterable value. Um, and then we're specifically grabbing a, a linear value from that. So J could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, as opposed to a Cartesian index of like one, 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 two, uh, or an N tuple, which would also be like one, 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 two, one, three. Um, and I also, I'm kind of muddling the waters here. When I say global here, um, we're we're talking the the other option is a local, um, which would be basically the the local space which it, within each like thread block that you're working on, um, and you'll use this sometimes if you're iterating over like a shared memory tile or something like this. Just in general, when you're thinking about GPU programming, um, the way I typically think about it is you're thinking about the memory operation. So J, you're thinking specifically about how to iterate over a single value in um, an array or something like that. You're working on a single value, uh, like a single pixel on, on your screen, a single element, uh, array element or something like that. Now, as to why Valentin said that doing it this way, having your new acceleration, uh, working on that value uh, ex exclusively and then writing at the end is faster, um, is because um, what we've done here is we've taken something from the big global memory right? That's a little bit slow to access. And we've moved it to our thread local memory. And then we're just iterating off the thread local memory. And then we go back to the accelerations uh, and, and add it all here. Now, keep in mind, I still have to go to global memory for particles J and particles K. I could speed this up by putting it onto a shared memory tile, which is faster to access, but I, I didn't want to get into that here. Um, 
but in general, right, when we're talking about GPU memory, uh, we're talking about GPU efficiency, we're always talking about minimizing the amount of times that we have to go to these larger memory banks. That's just something to think about. Um, okay, so let's talk about how we want to run this kernel. Uh, so we have the kernel defined, right? Uh, and so now we want to just create some sort of function that will basically find the accelerations for us. So we're going to say function uh, find accelerations here. Um, and this is going to take in our accelerations array. Again, it's just a set of accelerations. We'll talk about that in a second. A set of accelerations. And then we read in the particles. Um, and then we end here. Now, here's where like the magic of kernel abstractions comes in. Um, already, the syntax here is, is relatively straightforward for a kernel programming language. But the cool part about kernel abstractions is that it allows you to write code that can execute on basically anything. It could be parallel CPU, um, or it could be any GPU backend. Uh, this could be, again, Ku arrays for uh, CUDA uh, NVIDIA cards, Rock arrays, which are going to be for AMD cards, um, One arrays, which are for Intel. Um, metal arrays, again, might be in its infancy, but it's still there. Uh, so you can basically iterate through any hardware um, with this. And in fact, there's also a JL array backend that is available on GPU arrays that I've been working on recently um, that can uh, also dispatch on kernel abstractions once that PR is through. And so if you wanted to like run like, I don't know, there's, there's another way you could do parallel array execution in that way if you wanted to do that as well. So because it's heterogeneous and you could use any any hardware, this is what you have to do. You first have to define your backend. Uh, backend. And that's going to be equal to get backend of your array. It doesn't matter what array. For now, we'll just do particles. Right? So if particles is an array, um, it's going to naturally say our backend is on the CPU. If it's a GPU array, then it's going to say our backend is whatever backend we're working on. It could be CUDA, it could be AMD, something like that. So we have the backend, and now we're going to uh, define what our kernel actually means. Uh, this is actually an interesting bit of syntax that I think is unique to kernel abstractions. I haven't seen it uh, before. Um, it's not unique, but I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, of backend, and then the number of threads we want to run, uh, which is 256. So OK, what's happening in this line is interesting. So what we did is we're defining what our kernel function is. So we defined our function down here. But what that does is it actually returns a, like a kernel struct or something that can then be dispatched on whatever uh, hardware you're working on, right? And so here, I'm, I'm defining that our kernel in particular are, is going to be running on this backend. And then we define a number of threads that we want to run, want to launch in parallel. The number doesn't actually matter too much. This doesn't mean we're running 256 iterations. This means that we're running with um, a block size of 256. Like I said before, um, we have like different like threads that are basically running in parallel. And so you could have like 10,000 iterations that you have to do, but you want to just run like uh, it in blocks of 256 each time. Um, it, that basically means that these threads have access to like kind of the sh same shared memory tile or something like this. This number doesn't matter too much and you can actually run the API without it if you want. Um, uh, like if you just by doing uh, find acceleration kernel at backend. And then finally we launch the kernel here. Um, and essentially we read in what we have down there. So I, I had accelerations, uh, particles, and uh, I think that was it. So then ND range is equal to length of particles. Okay. So finally, what's that last thing doing? Uh, it's specifying our n-dimensional range uh, that we're going through. So again, if you have 10 million particles, that's totally fine. It means our ND range is 10 million. So this, I think, will run. For our find accelerations kernel, we just have to modify our end body our end body loop down here, um, so that we define the accelerations um, at the start. And the other thing is we want to specify that particles here is of some array type. So it looks like you rewrote this method find accelerations now using the kernel. Yep. And so that that kind of replaces what we had before. And then I know that you just mentioned this, but so the find accelerations kernel function at this point. You know, you talk about how important it is to think about how you're accessing memory from mm -hmm. the shared uh, memory bank, right? Yeah. But here it, it's relying completely on the shared memory bank because you need to call on particles. Um, actually, it's it's relying on, we're not using the shared memory bank at all here. I'm sorry, I was maybe a bit confusing earlier. Uh, we're just using the global memory and then the thread local memory. Uh, the shared memory is a specific memory bank that you could create if you wanted to uh, if you wanted to use it. So it's like it's like a middle layer between the two. It's not quite um, thread local, um, but it's like shared within a block. So these 256 uh, threads that you have would all have access to the same shared memory tile. And so if you wanted those threads to have quick access to something, um, you could do it in that way.
And what I was oh. saying was that the particles of K and J, you could find some tricky way to copy those to a faster memory uh, location if you wanted to. Um, so then the arguments here, accelerations and particles, say that they exist in global memory. And then when you run this function, does it does that get transferred to the thread? So the yes. particles, it does. Okay. That's what this is doing here. So we're uh, the, that's a thread local of. Um, uh, value uh, variable um, that is new acceleration. And so we're copying that down to thread level memory. And that's why this is faster when we do this uh, oh. than uh, what I had before, which was accelerations of bracket I or bracket J. But how about particles? Is particles on the thread or is it still global? Yeah, this one's still global. Um, it's still global. Yeah. Um, Again, there, okay. there are some tricks that you could play to get it into shared memory. There are methods that I think some people are using um, so that you can use that shared memory tile in a tricky way so you can more quickly access these particles and they're not in global memory. But the fact is, if you're using GPU code, I, I think just putting it in global memory already gives you, um, like, you're, you're getting a lot of performance already. Um, mm -hmm. You just want to minimize the amount of trips that you're taking to global memory is all. So if you can. And so this was a very simple thing that we could do up here just to minimize uh, one or two, well, in this case, a thousand trips uh, to global memory. Uh, by putting it thread local here. So would it make any difference if let's say you take particles and do the exact same thing where you just load it all at once? Or is that oh, same yeah. in terms of You're right. Cost? We could do this. Right. Okay. Yeah, we could do this. I... And then we do that. Yeah. We could hope that the compiler will notice that we access the same location over and over again. And then maybe magically it can move the uh, data movement but it's often worthwhile to be explicit about these things yeah um since we are right we are, if you're already doing the work to go into the gpu like doing these kind of small optimization where it's like i'm only accessing this data once like right. because the the actually it's right particles is not being written to in this kernel so it the compiler might do this optimization, but if it were written to, then it would need to prove that you never write to this one location. Yeah. And then maybe my last question is the ND range argument, is that specific to this kernel exclamation mark method that exists in kernel abstractions? Yeah, so when we created this function up here, uh, we one uh, specialized or uh, figured out what backend we're running. So that's that's this step up here. Um, and then the next line, we're launching that. And when when we created the function for this backend, like we created a function for the rock array, it basically gives you an additional um, uh, argument for the function that is ND range. Um, there's also one which is like work group size, work group, what is it again? It's like something. Um, so you can specify the block size and stuff yeah. if you want. Um, yeah, you can also leave the 256 out and then it will yeah. try to guess the right number. Yeah. Um, and you can also use work group size to specify that runtime. Yeah, and you could run it all in one line by doing find accelerations kernel. I mean, yeah, that's I, I prefer this. Yeah, yeah. I, I also I, I just prefer it a little bit more yeah. statically known as well. So in in uh, CUDA, you would see the at CUDA macro, and then you would need to specify threads and blocks. And in kernel abstraction, you just say, hey, this is the number of iterations I want to execute. That's what ND range stands for. The yeah. Um, and multi-dimensional range that specifies the number of iterations you want to execute. Yeah. And in yeah. particular, one advantage of kernel abstractions over CUDA is that this at index command is actually remarkably easier here, uh, similar to how it's remarkably easier in OpenCL, in that um, you don't have to specify, like with CUDA, you have to think about where the thread is in each block and how that's related to global memory. Here, it's kind of all done for you, more or less. Um, and so this is another really big advantage uh, for using kernel abstractions over other kernel languages, I would say. Um, so next, we're just going to add this kernel in. Um, and so I'm just going to say, um, what is the best way to do this? I think I'm going to do it this way. I'm going to put it in this loop, and you guys are going to get mad at me. And that's fine. I, I don't mind anger. It's OK. I, I live on the internet. So I'm going to say accelerations uh, here is going to be equal to some array type. I, I, I'll, I'll fix this in a second, but this is just like a, a first. Um, and then we have to specify what they're going to be. So again, I'm just going to use a tuple here. Uh, probably the same thing as we had down here. And we're going to start them all at zero uh, for i is equal to 1 to n in here. 
So I think I could do this. And then we do accelerations um, uh, of uh, this is going to be dot equal to um, this guy. Yep. So I could define them here and then like reinitialize it every step. Uh, and then I think I can just take this, this out. So we should be able to take this entire thing out here and just put in the find accelerations kernel. So it should now just be find accelerations of accelerations and then particles. And did I use anything else or is it just accelerations and particles? Just those two. I think that that might run. We'll see if it breaks uh, in just a bit. Uh, now we just have to do the same for move particles. Uh, it's a very similar thing. Uh, but like I said before, we could actually just use uh, the broadcasting infrastructure if we if we wanted to. It, because really all we're doing here is we're doing um, like we're calling the move particle function um, on each uh, each one of these. So I could do function move particles here, exclamation point. We do particles, uh, accelerations, and then dt. And here we do particles of this is going to be uh, dot equals to uh, move particles of, uh, will this work? I think this will work. So, so uh, sure. the only question I have is, uh, so you need a dot, um, uh, between the oh. move particles and its parentheses, which is the weirdest thing always. Yeah. Um, and then the question is, why do we do the um, square bracket colon? Ah, good point. I we think can we can that. just remove that from all yeah. of them, and then that should definitely just work. Yeah, I think this will work just fine. Um, I, in in like the code that I was writing before, I actually had this uh, to run with a kernel as well, but. I mean, we already talked about kernel syntax, so I think this will work. And so then we just do move particles in here, find accelerations, uh, and then we move particles. So yeah. if I got this right, so you're saying that if you use the dot notation for broadcasting, then mm -hmm. you don't need to write this at kernel function explicitly um, done. Yeah, in principle, it spawns its own kernel to run this. Um, so right. by 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 using the broadcasting infrastructure, we can do the same thing we did before when we did b is like dot equals one or something, and we're we're creating our own basically custom kernel um, to to run uh, using uh, a different syntax. So yeah, so like implicitly, there's going to be an at kernel function that does uh, or kind yeah. of similar. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, it's it's going to be like, for this case, it's going to be like the rock array backend, or if you're using CUDA, the Q array backend, but it's essentially the same thing. So. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. And then um, below, when you were showing the example with threads, is that threads on the CPU? Like you're showing yeah. it as an alternative to using kernels? Okay. Yep. Yeah. So that was just, that was just how you would parallelize it if you wanted to do this on the CPU. Okay. okay. Um, and I think two things, um, right, we, we remarked upon the fact that originally we had a race condition between like the finding the acceleration and moving the particles. Um, we resolved that here by storing the accelerations into a separate array and doing right. the computation first, finishing that computation, and then doing the move independently. Right. Um, the other thing, uh, we, we do this accelerations um, setting to zero which we could get around uh, of not doing by within the kernel uh, setting new acceleration equals to the zero of the element type of accelerations. Uh, so wait, could, zero of the element type of... Just, oh, comment, oh. just comment this line out and go into the kernel. Mm. Oh, right, right, right. In the kernel itself, we could do it here. Right, and then we, we could say, set new yeah. acceleration equals mm -hmm. zero L type accelerations. That would also do it. There's one other thing I want to say. Oh, right. The other thing is that this broadcasting actually has a, a trick to it, though, that I did want to mention in that uh, the, this broadcasting infrastructure is certainly going to parallelize it across the GPU. Um, sometimes you don't get parallel CPU execution from this. Um, and I think this is a case where you wouldn't get parallel CPU execution. So if you, you were to write it You currently never get parallel CPU execution with oh. that. 
that's yeah. something uh, we hope to fix eventually in Julia Core. Um, so one big advantage of rewriting this in kernel abstractions as opposed to using the broadcasting infrastructure is that if you did want to use parallel CPU execution from kernel abstractions, um, doing it uh, this way would give you that parallelization. So, all right, let's see if this actually runs because it probably won't. Um, yep. Um, all right, see if that runs. Okay, and now let's check the uh, um, LS here. We have a bunch of output images. It should hopefully be the same thing as before. Ristretto. All right, sure. That looks great. All the particles are moving into each other. Now let's try it on the rock array. AMD, GPU. And I think this one should also run. If not, um, I have another script that's almost identical to this one that does work. So um, <laughs> we'll just pretend we wrote that one. OK, so we ran that. I think that ran on the GPU. Uh, and if we do look at the images, we should get, yeah, basically the same thing. The render distribution is also different. So that says to me it did run a different execution. So bump up the, uh, if you can, bump up the number of atoms, because I'm actually kind of curious mm. to see. Yeah, yeah. I was going to show that in just a second. The scaling here is quite interesting. All right, so we're going to run here. Um, so we can now run this again. So I'm going to include it. Uh, and I'm specifically not going to output anything. So let me just remove all the output images just to make sure that works. And we're going to do run what end body? What, I don't remember what I called it. End body. End body. And then we're going to spe specify uh, output images is equal to false. Because that shouldn't output anything. And just double check it doesn't. It does not. Um, so let's run it. So we're going to try the array first. And we're just going to time that. Uh, and let me make sure there's no output, and then at time. OK, that's kind of too quick to see anything. So let's move that to 1,000. Still quite quick. Um, oh, because we're only doing 20 time steps. Uh, so let's do 10,000. All right, so now we're, we're getting to the point where, OK, we see, uh, what is this, 10,000 atoms are running at 1.42 seconds. So let's do this on the rock array. Um, oh, that was an at time as opposed to a AMD GPU dot at time. Um, but so here's our AMD time mm -hmm. and here's our uh, CPU time. And you can see at the scale that we actually see a significant speed up on the GPU, although I'm kind of curious as to how it's that much of a speed up. Um, that seems kind of suspiciously fast. But even so, mm -hmm. uh, you see that speed up. But I mean, we did check. It did seem to be running. So if we do 1,000 here for the array, and then we do a thousand. I mean, you're completely unparalyzed, right, on the CPU right now. Oh no, no, it's paralyzing the first time uh, the fine accelerations, but I'm not paralyzing. You still have the threads in there, okay? I, oh no, no, no. Also... The kernel abstractions can run on parallel CPU execution. Oh, oh, okay. So gotcha. that's that's one big advantage here, and that we could run it on the array first, yeah, just to make sure it that. works. And then when it runs on the array and we get parallel CPU execution, it probably, I mean, you noticed we still had an issue, but it probably also runs on the GPU. Uh, and then it's just a matter of like fixing the code up so that runs as well. Yeah. So, so if you look at base threads dot n threads, you will see how many um, threads Julia is using. Yeah, so I have 12 yeah. threads. So And we, we, we could like, right, this is now would be an interesting experiment to say, hey, by the way, look, what happens if you only use four threads? Um, is right. n body then taking three times longer? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and I, I could do that right now. Uh, I think part of the issue is that we didn't paralyze the move particles as well. So that's going to be like a little bit slower than, and we could do that as well by putting an at time like here. I mean, yeah, you could use, a, or just do an at profile. Oh yeah. Or an at profile as well. But, um, outside. Um, but yeah. Anyway, um, this is, sorry, it took, uh, you know, close to two hours, uh, but uh, this is kind of the whole thing. So we, uh, we introduced GPU programming at the very start in, a, I think, a relatively simple way. Uh, we coded up a full n-body script, um, talked about caveats, algorithmic caveats could be like we could have uh, a neighbor list, which would uh, speed up computation because we have basically less trips. Like basically this particle k changes. And so we'd have less trips to, to global memory um, and we'd have fewer uh, iterations as well because uh, it wouldn't be through lengths of particle, it'd be length of neighbors uh, for that list. Um, so that's one big algorithmic change we could make to speed this up. Um, in terms of other performant things that we could do, uh, like I said, you can get parallel CPU execution by modifying this move particle so it runs in a kernel as opposed to just running over broadcasting infrastructure. Um, and we also talked a lot about kernel abstraction syntax, how it works, why it works that way, what the at index is, all that kind of stuff. So I think that's everything. So are there questions?
So I, I will say that we're currently working on uh, having kind of better support for kernel abstractions in a way. Uh, for example, the documentation is a bit lacking in some areas. Um, and there's some things that we want to be able to do. Uh, like, for example, we, I mentioned kernel fusion before as something that like people want to do. And, you know, in principle, there are ways to use like some metaprogramming hacks in order to somehow make this happen. Um, but like, it's also like, we really have to radically think about how we want to change the API for that to work. And so there's, there's some stuff that we're looking at, like new documentation, uh, getting kernel abstractions and GPU arrays so we can get some of the functionality from CUDA to all the other GPU backends, all this kind of stuff. But, uh... Yeah, right now, I, I think kernel abstraction is already pretty good. Um, and it, I think it's worth using if, if you have really any workload. I mean, even if you just want to do parallel CPU execution, you know, writing it in this way gives you, it, it might not be super fast. Like there could be some, uh, it's pretty quick, but there could be some like CPU parallelism thing that you could do to make it faster if you know your stuff. But just writing it in the at kernel format already gives you really good parallel CPU execution. I was just thinking like, is the challenge of writing this neighborless algorithm to try to you know, make sure that you actually get cost savings from it. So of course that depends on the scale of the system that you're dealing with, but you want mm. it so that you can compute the neighbor list more efficiently than you can actually going through the entire loop, of course. But yeah. Yeah. So but inherently that's not Yeah. So it, it, the, the problem is twofold with the neighbor list. So the first is that um, the neighbor list in, has, is a data structure that's a list of lists and notably that list of lists changes in size based on where the particles are in location, right? Because if a whole bunch of particles are clumped together, the neighbor list might be quite long, but if they're very spread out, like later in the simulation, it could be smaller. So um, the naive approach is just to, you know, allocate a giant buffer and just to say, okay, we're just going to like work within this buffer um, with some sort of like array of array struct or something like this. Um, and that's fine. Um, uh, but if we allocate on the CPU, because it is technically faster probably to generate that particular type of neighborless on the CPU and then transfer it to the GPU, well, now we're biting that GPU CPU transfer, which is the slowest part. And, uh, and GPUs are really good at hiding uh, latency. So right, every we're here we're saying, okay, uh, we're doing N squared memory accesses um, or like, um, yeah, basically, um, and that might be fine up until a certain size of elements, right? right? Because the GPU is just hiding all of that and you're not even going to see the slowdown until you get to a problem size. This is uh, too large for you to be in, of interest at that moment. Um, right. So the payoffs start happening at the like large size scale. Um, and then the question is, of course, always like, what is the cost of calculating the neighbor list? What is the cost of moving it to the GPU? Um, it's all worthwhile in the end, but it also always depends on like, what is the problem size you actually care about at the end. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. So that means that it, it's really a case where you're calculating those neighbor lists on the CPU. You want to do that once and then just transfer it once to the GPU. Yeah. Or have a way in which you can just generate it all the time on the GPU and you don't have to think about the CPU at all, which is, is a challenge. Like this is why like, uh, bringing up uh, unified memory stuff because he's like, oh, in that case, we could just have the CPU do the calculation. The problem is unified memory is, I, okay, there's a lot of problems with it and I don't necessarily want to go into it, but there's certain things that will be faster to do on the CPU. Just They will be. And anything that requires iteration, usually summations are easier to do on the CPU, though sometimes you can still make them fast on the GPU. Like things that require, if you can't naively paralyze it, probably the CPU is still pretty good at doing this thing. And so... Uh, that's yeah right as an example in a reduction case even if i'm trying to do something clever and i'm doing like a tree-based reduction where i'm like reduce first one half and then the other half and then the next half and trying to like basically come down well at some point like i launched a kernel with uh, ten thousand threads but at the tail end i'm only using two and then one thread to do the addition so i'm not using the parallelism of of the um, GPU anymore. And that is the moment when like um, the tail ends of these algorithms become the slow part. But even if you're trying to do that on the on the CPU and you're using um, unified virtual memory, the memory movement is still not free. Right. Um, so whether or not you're doing it explicitly by doing um, copies uh, as we do in Julia very often, or if you're using implicit memory transfers like uh, Cocos does, the memory movement is not free. Um, and that's going to be what, the, What's the implicit memory transfer? Uh, if you use unified virtual memory, that's what Cocos okay. uses, right? Then you now, exp instead of doing 
the movement explicitly when you say, hey, by the way, I need this data on the CPU here. You're doing it implicitly and you're saying, hey, by the way, now I'm going to ask the operating system to give me this data um, on the CPU. It has to go over to the GPU, move it to the CPU, and that's not the same cost, like right, different amortization costs maybe. If you only need mm -hmm. one page, it's cheaper. Um, so there's all kinds of like trade-offs uh, at play. Yeah, and one important thing to mention is something that Valentin just said, and that you know it's all a matter of scale. Like sometimes the CPU is quite quick, and if you're only running with like a hundred, maybe a thousand atoms, you probably don't need GPU uh, execution. You know, when you start talking about like really using the GPU, you really want these big problem sizes, right? Because that's where you get the best speed up, and that's where you can show the 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 GPU power over the CPU. If you, if you start talking about like smaller atom numbers, um, all of a sudden it's like well. Okay, it's nice to have it on the GPU. You might see some speed up. In this very naive case, we see a speed up, but it's not guaranteed, um, and it might not be worth necessarily putting through all, putting all the hassle in. The nice thing about it is that with Julia, it's not that much hassle. You know, like I just showed it how how you do it. I mean, you you, you basically just think about heterogeneous programming for just a second here with this Git backend, and and then you launch it as a function instead of in a loop. Some caveats here, but it, it's not too much extra um, to think about, which is quite helpful. But even so, um, when people talk about CPU or and versus GPU execution, they're usually thinking about very, very big numbers where you can make use of the GPU. The the other thing to uh, point out, like at, when James was executing the kernel for the first time, the kernel version for the first time, there was like a noticeable pause, yep. right? And uh, that yep. is doing a lot of compilation, doing a lot of work um, on the other side. So if you're trying to like iterate quickly and you're changing your algorithm and you want to just figure out how that goes and you're like, well, I'm waiting. Well, in extreme use cases, like I'm recompiling this ocean model, uh, it, it's, it might take 10 minutes, right? And that uh, is too much time. Yeah. Um, and then just working with the CPU version where the caching is more efficient might, might, might be fine. Yeah. Um, Right. But then you want to go to big problem sizes or you want to run instead of 20 time steps, you want to run a million time steps and suddenly you like after every like a uh, tenth of a performance because uh, you're like, well, I, I don't, uh, I need to finish, have this calculation finished before I finish my PhD. And that's, that's a good point as well, as far as like uh, uh, development costs, you know, because it does take sometimes a full minute, two minutes for me to just get the code to run for the first time on the GPU. And so if the code's only going to run for a minute total and it takes 10 minutes or like a minute for compilation time, uh, anyway, it, it, it's a matter, you have to play with the numbers. This isn't like an exact science, like for, for every piece of code that you write, there's going to be like benefits and drawbacks of using the GPU. A lot of people like to just say it's better in every way, but that's not true. You have to like actually weigh uh, like development time and all this kind of stuff. So it, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. This is where the Julia pre-compilation stuff does kind of bite you in the butt. And the other thing we showed off, but I didn't talk about, were these error messages that we got uh, way up here with um, kernel abstractions, which were a little bit annoying. Let me see if I can find it here. No, look, they're a little bit annoying, but the reason they're annoying is that when you created the kernel, um, it basically dispatched essentially two functions, a CPU function and a GPU function. And you see, we have here the CPU find accelerations kernel. We, we're going through multiple layers of abstraction. And so the error messages become a little bit harder to read because we're, um, you know, we created a kernel, which is an abstract function that is then executing a separate function. And then we have to get the error message in the kernel itself. And sometimes, you know, it just, you have issues with it. So um, I think the, the biggest sin here is that, um, uh, the stack trace says macro expansion yep. gives you line 76 and then cpu find accelerations kernel gives you a stack trace within kernel obstruction yeah i look my uh, look into the mirror myself and i go like where did i go wrong yeah i mean it's hard uh but you know it does give you the end body lines here and and you can find it it's just it takes a little bit more digging than um uh, it, it's to the point that sometimes like when I write a kernel objections kernel, like I see an error and I just look at the code first instead of the error message. Cause I'm just hoping I find what I, whatever the error was first. Um, because sometimes I just, I just have trouble. My eyes glaze over somehow. Um, but it's still fine. It's, it's all good. And like I said, again, writing it in the kernel format gives you the parallel CPU execution, which is great. In my mind, it's, it's kind of like another way to do threads that add threads, but also gives you GPU execution as well. And, and that's quite, quite good. Um, 
but you know, Valentin isn't quite happy with the performance of the CPU implementation of kernel abstractions. But I still think it's it's still essentially it depends the same on the com it depends on the complexity of the kernel. Yeah, okay, that's fair. Because kernel abstractions was written to be like first GPUs and then secondly CPUs, um, it made a couple of trade off decisions that uh, made it easier to target GPUs and harder to target GP uh, CPUs efficiently. And yeah. so if, as soon as you start using like shared memory, um, uh, things get more complicated yeah. on the CPU than they would need to. Yeah, there's also like the synchronizations and at uniforms. And anyway, this is everything we want to show off. Uh, I, I appreciate you guys sticking here. I realize any any last lingering questions before we call it? Thank you, James. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Uh, I I'm happy that uh, we got through it and that you know it's it's there. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye.